This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB Studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning. Welcome to Racing Across America on this Saturday morning. I'm Seth Merrow. Thanks for joining us. A couple nice interviews we taped yesterday coming up, but before we do that, let me hit on uh, some housekeeping here. First, if you're in the Plattsburgh area, it's a Fan Appreciation Day today. Swing on by and enjoy that. Also, some uh, bonus action, Churchill bonus action, and Delmar bonus action over the weekend as well. 3% Churchill, a couple of percent uh, Delmar. There are some restrictions. Check out the website for more information, capitalotb.com. Also, definitely want to remind you that coming up on Friday, a uh, day after Thanksgiving, the Bounty Bet. It's a mandatory pay with over $2,000 in the bank. It's going to be the late pick five at Aqueduct. Again, that's coming up this Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. Just play that late pick five at Aqueduct with your Capital OTV bet account, and you're in for all or part of that bounty. So keep that in mind for uh, Friday. Also keep in mind, and, and I'm going to reach out. Hopefully we'll get Ron Nicoletti on, but tomorrow, mandatory pay down at Gulfstream Park West, the rainbow uh, pick six. There's a million dollars in the pool. So uh, get ready to jump in. Take a look at the PPs today uh, at the 20 cent increment. You can put a nice ticket together. And again, hopefully tomorrow on Racing Across America, we'll have some uh, good conversation about that. But tomorrow, closing day at Gulfstream Park West, mandatory payout. If things hold together and nobody hits it today, there's a million dollars in the pool. It'll balloon up significantly tomorrow, Sunday, Gulfstream Park West, Rainbow Six. And just quickly, uh, news from the week. Interesting number of groups uh, had a press conference this week and announced the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition, kind of a pushback on what has been uh, the focus of uh, the, the mainstream media and some critics of horse racing during the year, obviously kind of launching from uh, the situation earlier this year at Santa Anita. But the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition was announced. Breeders' Cup, Churchill, Naira, Delmar, the Stronic Group, uh, they'll be looking at medication reforms, vet exams, uh, they'll have some proposals uh, coming up, but uh, as a group, they'll uh, work things out. Um, so again, that the industry uh, pushing back a little bit. Also, if you go to Equidaily, I linked to uh, a couple of nice articles. Our friend Pete Fornatal had an op-ed in one of the California newspapers uh, supporting horse racing. Donna Brothers had a little pushback as well. So uh, some nice uh, info from the industry and industry folks. Uh, over the past week or so, as far as, again, the criticism that horse racing has taken uh, over the past, you know, really since going back to the beginning of the year. All right, let's get right to it because uh, going to be an abbreviated edition today with the early noon post time at Aqueduct. That means talking horses goes on a little bit earlier today, so we'll go to mm, 1045 or so which works out great because that'll time right to uh, the two interviews we did yesterday. A little bit later on, Brad Cox will join us. He has Dot Matrix in the Red Smith this afternoon at Aqueduct, but also touched on with him. Uh, Kafefi and British Idiom is two winners and po probable Eclipse Award winners from the Breeders' Cup. Mr. Monomoy, the uh, Monomoy girl sibling who had the nice win last weekend at uh, Churchill Downs. Talked about all that and much more with Brad coming up a little bit later on. But we'll start things out. Ron Gearkink, uh, Daily Racing Forum, covers Woodbine. Um, there are a couple of nice stakes at Woodbine today with Sovereign Award potential. That's their Eclipse uh, Awards. But Pink Lloyd runs today. He could be in the running for a Sovereign Award. Muskoka Gold in the two-year-old race. Um, so a couple of nice stakes today. And we also hit on tomorrow's stake 
at Woodbine as well with Ron. So we'll kick things off. Ron Gearking from the Daily Racing Forum. Happy to be joined now by our friend Ron Gearking from uh, the Daily Racing Forum. Coverage of Woodbine. We uh, sit down the press box from him when we make our couple of visits up there every year. Ron, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you today? Very good. Happy to talk to you about a couple of stakes on Saturday that well, I, I guess both probably have some sovereign in, implications. Certainly the Kennedy Road does. We'll also hit on the Bess Arabian that comes up on Sunday up there at Woodbine. Before we talk the stakes, uh, just update us. Turf season is over up uh, up there, right? Yeah, it's it's pretty cold. So um, it's, we have all Tapita racing until uh, closing day, uh, December 15th. And what was the... the uh, uh, opinion at the end of the season on the, the new inner turf course. I know I read your article and certainly sounds like the drainage worked out because you said pretty much the entire season it was firm. Yeah, unbelievable. It, was, <laughs> it really was. I mean, we had a Wednesday uh, back in the summer where we poured rain in the morning and when we raced on it that night, it was firm. So the water just goes right through it. Nice. Uh, and uh, again, so that that's wrapped up. Not unusual for this time of year. I talked to Dave Rodman a week or so ago, and they'd wrapped it up down at Laurel as well. It's that time of year at all the venues. But again, a couple of nice races coming up on Saturday I wanted to touch on. And, and as I noted, Kennedy Road will certainly have some sovereign implications because Pink Lloyd, despite finishing technically uh, fourth in the, the bold venture, broke the gate early uh, that was the weekend we were up there and he was declared a non-starter so that's a, a draw line through that one otherwise he's five for five for the year an undefeated season puts him in the the hunt again for horse of the year which he had a couple of years ago robert tiller certainly in your article thinks he's in the uh, running for that so pink lloyd in the kennedy road we're going to go back and take a look while we talk at the vigil from july 14th this was the last time Pink Lloyd was in a graded stakes this year. Pink Lloyd will be the number one horse, winning this one pretty easily. Faces graded uh, company again on Saturday. Extravagant Kid ships in from Brendan, Brendan Walsh. Looks interesting. Hats off to Robert Tiller with a potential uh, sovereign award on the line. He enters his own horse, Reconfigure, who I think is a player in here, as is uh, Richie's in the house. I think it's a nice field. What are your thoughts in uh, Saturday afternoon's Kennedy Road? Yeah, it really is a cool field, isn't it, Seth? Um, yeah. You know, Pink Lloyd, the race centers around him. Um, you know, after that gate mishap uh, on uh, September 14th, he decided to freshen him up and passed on a, a subsequent Ontario Sire Stakes to try and get him ready for this race. Um, he's pretty happy with the way he's doing, uh, you know, because around this time last year, the, he, uh, he bled in a race and he had to put him away for the year. But um, Pink Lloyd, actually, if you look through his whole PTs, he has never lost off a layoff. Um, well, those were sort of winter layoffs and when he won first time out, but this is a shorter layoff. I think he's coming up to the race in good order. I mean, you know, at, at odds on, I think he's worth trying to beat with a couple, of, you know, there's a couple of shippers, like you mentioned, Extravagant Kid. That's who I landed on as my uh, top pick. He actually gave uh, Pink Lloyd a run for his money back in the Jacques Cartier stakes, a grade three back on uh, May 4th. He was second to him that uh, that day, and he went on to have a really good campaign as a turf sprinter for, uh, for Brendan Walsh. He's the uh, three to one second choice on the line. And the uh, the other shipper is uh, the Larry Ravelli trainee, uh, Richie's in the house. Uh, he's come here twice this year. He uh, just missed in the Neartic, the Great Two Neartic on the turf two back, and uh, he came back from Hawthorne uh, three weeks ago, and he won what was sort of like the prep for the Kennedy Road. It was an open allowance. He beat a pretty good field in that race with a 95 buyer. And he's, you know, in the past he's been kind of a need to lead horse, but now he's been able to sit second and, and make a run. So he's 5-1 to one on the line. Now he's, um, I think they're both, uh, they both have a pretty decent chance to uh, upset Pink Lloyd. And again, in your article, you, you talked to, to Robert Tiller, and he talked about the gate index for Pink Floyd, maybe changing up the training a little bit. Uh, boy, a couple of bullet workouts underneath. We've talked to to Robert when we've been up there and uh, he talks about this horse when he gets out on the training track he just he wants to run and those workouts certainly indicate it but I'm curious did you talk to him at all about reconfigure because as they say I'm interested he not only trains he owns the horse Pink Lloyd with a shot at the Sovereign Award but Robert Tiller puts in his own horse who again I think reconfigure is a horse that's a little bit interesting in there as well yeah true and he really the claim of the meat so far um uh, he took him off Cassie for 25000 back in uh, July. Um, talking to Cassie earlier, this, he, this horse was a given to him 
from his previous owner because uh, the horse was dealing with the bow. You know, he uh, he had this old bow and it's you know healed up, and uh, he ran a couple of good races on the tapita in the <laughs> spring, and then when he dropped them in for twenty five, uh, Bob took them, and uh, wow, he's he's made probably one hundred and forty thousand <laughs> since then, uh, including a narrow loss in the, in the Arctic. So he's a he's sort of the intriguing. Uh, uh, newcomer in the field now. Bob thinks he's maybe better on turf than he is on the tapita. He probably is. So um, he, he's a bit of a long shot, but he gets a, he gets our hot young rider uh, Kazushi Kimura. He'll be the top apprentice in Canada this year, and I, I think he'll get some uh, Eclipse Award consideration too. I think. Yeah, that's worth noting. Uh, the the races he's been on turf uh, most recently, and this one obviously goes to the main track, the tapita. So that may play into uh, reconfigure, but it's also going to play into some of the horses in the uh, Coronation Futurity. This mm -hmm. one's kind of fun. Two-year-old race up there, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollar purse, a mile and an eighth. Um, we're going to take a look. Go back to the Cup and Saucer on October six. Muskoka Gold's going to be the number five. Please call me back the number six. They'll run a close up, one two in here. Uh, they're both back on Saturday afternoon. Muskoka Gold subsequently a good uh, second in the open grade three gray last time. And off of that, he's kind of where I'm tilting. Please call me back has only been on the turf so far. So I guess the surface is maybe a question mark. But this field's also interesting because a couple of ship-ins. You have uh, Steve Asmussen coming in with a Winchell horse, Halo again. And Tomcat Black comes in for grand motion. What are your thoughts on the Coronation Futurity? Well, yeah, you know, it's, uh, the Muskoka Gold, he's a big, strong horse by Lee. I mean, very well regarded by Cassie. And he wins this race. He's going to probably be champion uh, two year old in Canada. And I think he's really got a good shot. I mean, he had a kind of a wide trip in the gray last time. He came flying on end, just, just a half length back. And, um, you know, he's just as good on the grass as he is on the PETA. He can handle both. I really think that the race goes through him. And um, please call me back. He was pretty good. He was a decent fifth in the Grade One Cup and Grade One Summer Stakes. I think when you were at Woodbine that day, yeah. and uh, he kind of flattened out late, but he came back and ran second to uh, Muskoka Gold in the uh, Cup and Saucer. Now, like you say, he's going to the Tapita for the first time. Um, he sort of certainly trained a lot on it. And if we go back to last weekend, uh, Roger Atfield did win a two-year-old stake here with a, a, a turf uh, a filly who. Did, Compete exclusively on the turf, and she won the uh, South Ocean Stakes last weekend on the Tapita. So he knows what he's doing when it comes to getting these horses ready to, to make the, the surface change. Yeah, Atfield does one coming down uh, for uh, the, the stake uh, at Aqueduct on Saturday too. Uh, that'll be fun to, to pay attention to. To the slam, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that horse is a, a nice contender in there. But you you do because uh, I, I I let off and, and kind of said uh, both of these races may have some sovereign potential. And obviously, you're more in tune with what the two-year-olds have done up there. You think a win by Muskoka Gold puts him in the driver's seat for a two-year-old sovereign? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, and uh, also coming up on Sunday, the Bess Arabian, uh, $175,000 up for grabs. Seven furlongs is the trip for the ladies. Boy, nice full field in here of 12. What are your thoughts on the Bess Arabian on Sunday? Yeah, this is kind of like the female version of the uh, Candy Road Seth. Uh, it, it's a Grade Two six furlongs as well. It's, it's really the top uh, top sprint race in the in the division, and it, it lured a sort of a real mixed bag of horses, uh, shippers and and a few good local fillies. Um, the five two favorite is uh, the Nobia, the uh, Jonathan Thomas, uh, uh, Belmont shipper who won the Grade Three Athenia in her last race. Um, she's never competed on uh, synthetics, only on turf. Um, I think that makes her vulnerable in here because horses who come here and don't have a race over the PETA or don't have a work over the PETA, they're really at a disadvantage. So I think she's worth trying to beat. Uh, uh, jo Josie Carroll and her three horses, and I, I like uh, Gamble Candy, um, a three-year-old filly that um, who seems to be a real uh, late, late bloomer. She beat um, straight three-year-olds last time in the Ruling Angel Stakes, but in that race she was really game. She she put away two horses on the front end and then opened up late and uh, did it with an 88 buyer. So I, I think she's a real uh, real up and comer amongst the uh, Philly and Bear sprinters on the ground. So. It, it it is a very fun race with a nice full field with as you say some shippers. Cherie Devos bringing in Lady Mamba. 
Trombetta, Mike Trombetta, who is interestingly shipped up there a lot of uh, often this year from that Fairhills base um, where they train on synthetics, and he's done very well uh, with some of the Live Oak runners, and Super Striking is in there. So fun race on uh, Sunday as well. You know, you alluded to it. You talked a little bit about the summer uh, stakes up there. Uh, the weekend we were up, our friends at West Point won with Decorated Invader. I'm just curious as to the, the thoughts, uh, some of the Woodbine Runners Breeders' Cup weekend. I thought Got Stormy ran well again coming out of the second in the Woodbine Mile. That uh, duel with Uni uh, got Stormy running second again, but I thought it was a good performance. Decorated Invader, I'm sure the West Point folks were disappointed. I was too uh, with the trip. Just went wide, and it's just tough on that course to go as wide as that one did. And I'll also toss, I read uh, in your column, it's kind of interesting because we talked with Brad Cox a little earlier and talked about British Idiom. British Idiom has a, a woodbine connection in that his dam was a, a juvenile stakes winner up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't uh, recall much about British Idiom, but um, yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the woodbine horses, you know, we, and your, uh, El Tormenta was uh, six feet and four and a half in the uh, Breeders' Cup uh, mile. He actually, you know, he kind of ran off on uh, De Silva on the front end. Uh, I don't think they wanted him being that aggressive, but he still, you know, didn't disgrace himself and uh, it kind of put him up there for, off, the, off of winning the Woodbine Mile, he's a leading contender for, co-leading contender for Canadian Horse of the Year along with um, Starship Jubilee, the uh, E.P. Taylor win winner. Yeah, it was, uh, as I say, a nice weekend for uh, some of those Woodbine runners uh, who, as they say, got stormy. Second place finish, but a good second. And just before we let you go, I want to talk about one more kind of news item because I pulled up an Echo Base, the uh, human leaders, and Eureka Da Silva once again leading on the jockey side and with the numbers. Seems like he's uh, in the driver's seat as being the leading jockey again. And as we talked to him when we were up there earlier this year, he's retiring and going on to kind of a, a personal trainer kind of a situation uh, uh, in his next career. I'm just curious, have they announced, is there going to be some kind of a, a special uh, a day for Eureka, something like that up there as the yeah, season ends? Yeah, I think uh, the second last weekend of the meet or nice. one, well, one of the last few days of the meet, there is going to be something uh, they're going to do with them. Yes, um, and this will be the last time he rides the uh, Pink Lloyd and may, unless he makes right. a, a, a quick comeback. But, <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, it's going to be uh, sad to see him go, but he's you know, he's 44 years old. I think it's 44. He's been riding for 30 years. If you go back to uh, when he started at 14 in, in Brazil, riding quarter horses. So he's been doing it a long time. I assume he's got a lot of money put away. I mean, hey, why not? You know, why not uh, enjoy the rest of your life and get away from the, the grind of uh, being a jockey and, you know, riding uh, seven or eight a day? And God bless, leaving at really the top of his career, which mm -hmm. you don't see very often. So God bless him. Wish him the best. And, and as I say, we've interviewed him a number of times. He's a nice guy, too, so it's easy to root yeah. for those kind of guys. For sure, yeah. Ron, uh, as always, appreciate the visit and uh, the thoughts on the weekend stakes, and we'll talk again. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for having me. Ron Gearkink, Daily Racing Forum, Woodbine coverage. Three nice stakes coming up on Saturday and Sunday. Caught up with Ron yesterday, and yesterday also caught up with trainer Brad Cox. Again, he has a dot matrix day in the Red Smith and some horses over the past few weeks, including a couple on Breeders' Cup weekend that uh, were winners that we wanted to catch up with as well. So we'll take a break. When we come back, trainer Brad Cox, stay tuned. Wagering on horse racing just got a lot easier at Capital OTB with our newly designed state-of-the-art mobile wagering site. Everything you need is right here on one easy-to-navigate mobile platform. Set your favorite tracks, pick your horses, place your bets, all with a simple tap of the screen. Plus, you'll have access to Capital OTB TV for all our network programming. So log on to CapitalOTBBet.com and see just how easy wagering on horse racing can be.
Albany County, an incredible destination to live, work, and play with easy connections to more than a dozen cities from our vibrant modern airport. It's a short trip downtown to a hive of culture and amusement from world-class shows at the newly renovated Times Union Center to reliving the past at the New York State Museum. From outdoor recreation to shopping to nightlife, Albany County has something for everyone. We'll see you soon. Here's some exciting news from Capital OTB. Capital Off-Track Betting and the Rivers Casino have partnered to bring you the finest experience in wagering on all your favorite thoroughbred and harness tracks from right inside the casino. Our newest location is open daily and can be found at Vance Flicks Bar, offering live tellers, self-serve betting terminals, racing information kiosks, and all the amenities you come to expect from Capital OTB. See you at the Rivers Casino in Schenectady. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Joined now by our friend Brad Cox. A uh, big week a couple of weeks ago at the Breeders' Cup. And, of course, we will touch on that, but also a runner this afternoon in uh, Aqueduct's feature of the Red Smith. So we want to hit on that. Brad, good morning. Good morning, Seth. Thanks for having me on. Happy to have you on. And as I say, talk a little today and also go back and maybe uh, hit on the future as well. But let's start things out with that feature at, at Aqueduct this afternoon and get you to talk a little bit about dot matrix the red smith grade three event a couple hundred thousand dollars up for grabs a mile and three eighths we're going to go back a couple of starts for a dot matrix we're going to watch the stretch run to the ashley t cole new york bread stakes race dot matrix will be the number four horse here get up by a, a margin of half a length um, as i say that was two races back subsequently a fifth place finish in the mohawk last time but talk a little bit about uh how dot matrix is coming into uh saturday's race and maybe more importantly how you think the the mile and three eighths will hit him well he's trying it really well um now this mile and three eighths is something we haven't tried with him uh, this is the idea of marshall graham i think it's a good idea it's something we've we've uh obviously not tried and experiment with him a little bit he you know he seems, seems to be somewhat one pace and he's able to get into his races easy enough but uh don't really have a big turn of foot maybe might be able to help him going a mile three eighths uh, it's a solid group of horses i mean it, it's um thought it was a deep field um but you know i think uh if you can take the distance he'll be competitive yeah and I, you know i've handicapped the race because i'm in doing the handicapping show on saturday afternoon and i you know saddler's joy on the numbers on the buyer numbers at least uh kind of stands out a little bit then i think it becomes very open i think you're you're right in the thick of things what's your confidence level on saturday well, I think, it, you know, like I said, with a good trip, I think he can be effective. And if, the, if he takes to the, the mile and three eighths once again, you know, he, he, he could, you know, lots of times with those type of races being, you know, three turns, I mean, it comes down to, you know, trips, um, saving ground, being able to tip out and get a good run, good clean run down the lane. And, you know, that's kind of what we're hoping for. Um, you know, Jose is a very, very good turf rider. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully, you know, he's never, he's yet to set on the horse, but he's he, a uh, pretty easy horse to ride, so I think so. If that was a good trip, he'll be okay. And talk a little bit about Marshall Cram. Uh, he's a friend of ours, too. Uh, we talk to him a lot about the contest. We have him uh, usually up at Saratoga. We'll have him sit in with us at some point. Contest player, a college professor, and uh, now more and more you see 10-strike racing uh, on the owner side. So he's become a kind of a prominent owner. I, I'm imagining he's got to be a fun guy to work with. Yeah, no doubt they got a good crew in place. Um, and uh, that they... Uh, uh, have, have really good set. I mean, really expanded their uh, operation. I mean, it, I think originally started with claiming horses, and you know they are into buying you know yearlings now and two-year-old training and you know quality stock. And you know they've got some really good horses. We had Irish Mischief there, part owner. Um, Irish Mischief. She won the feature yesterday at Churchill, running like a 94, oh, 95 nice. buyer. Um, but so I mean, you know they they've got some quality stock and looking to improve it at all times. Um, you know, I have Warriors Charge was fourth in the pre this past year and. He's back and he's on the comeback trail, so uh, I think he'll have a big 2020. Uh, looking forward to getting him back to the race. But no, they're they're great operation to deal with, and you know, it's easy. You know, if a horse has a setback, they, they take bad news as well as the good news, and that's really what makes great owners. Yeah, and I think if you got a guy who's a contest player, he knows the ups and the downs of the game, so that probably helps out. Uh, just talk a little bit more about Dot Matrix and what the game plan may be after this. Obviously, turf meant. And with the, the turf uh, wrapping up in the northeast, 
what are your plans uh, going forward for Dot Matrix? Well, he likes the fairgrounds. Um, it, it could be, you know, we'll see what happens uh, to that later today. But it, it, he likes the fairgrounds. Um, it's possible that we could take him down there uh, and, and campaign him through the winter. He's he's a very sound horse. Uh, there's been some times where we just backed off of him, not because of any physical issues, just more of like you know maybe just being a little flat. But come back and he's ever been as good this year as he was last year. So you know if if he's doing well and comes out of this race in good shape and and you know performs well, we, we may just press on with him. Uh, he's been lightly raced this year. It took us a little while to get him back to the races um, after his fresh freshman last winter. And, like I said, that was just um, by design, no physical issues. So um, um, he, he, he's, um, we'll, we'll see how things go later today. And now that'll probably have a lot to do with what we do moving forward. Okay, six-year-old gelding, uh, 29 starts, nine wins, uh, just uh, virgin on half a million dollars in earnings. So he's been a nice horse for you guys. Uh, just generally, that kind of brings up in my mind, again, as turf racing is kind of winding up here in the Northeast, your base also down in Churchill, uh, obviously turf racing will wind up. This time of year, talk just a little bit about the nuts and bolts of business. I always say, you know, when we have time to talk to trainers up in Saratoga, uh, we can get into it a little bit. But I, I, it's always interesting to me that people, I think, look at trainers and, and just see kind of the... the What's obvious, you're out there training horses, you're in the winter circle after a race, but you're really small businessmen. And this time of year, talk a little bit about how you transition from some of these venues, uh, you know, the Belmonts and the Aqueducts and the Churchills, and then your, your base of operation in the wintertime down at the fairgrounds. How do you kind of go through your stables and decide who goes where at this time of year? A lot of the time it has to do with the turf, uh, and, you know, obviously state bread programs as well, if you have a New York Red. I mean, the best thing in the world right now is the New York Red that are running the dirt. Um, or not the best thing in the world, <laughs> but if, if they're going to be in New York in the winter, that's the thing to have New York Reds on the dirt. Um, and obviously, open horses. I mean, they can, you know, that, that that's not a bad thing to have them open, made in special ways. They're claiming horses fit well at Aqueduct through the winter. But obviously, if you have grass, you have to ship them sent down south. And because the grass horse on the New York New York bread on the grass, you know, it's a good time to give them a little break, fresh them up, get them ready for the spring. So that's just kind of how you adjust and move around the horses. They're stable there in New York uh, for the most part. It has a lot to do with the grass and the New York bread. Let's uh, take a look, at, and I want to go back to last weekend. You had a couple of winners down at Churchill, and I want to start out. Let's take a look at the replay of a maiden special weight event. Mr. Monomoy, a sibling to Monomoy girl, uh, first career start, a little bit of trouble, wound up fourth. Uh, back in the middle of October, but the uh, second start of the career we're watching, Mr. Monomoy, the number seven horse, five and a half length win. Talk about this win last Saturday. Well, he ran, he ran well. I mean, we were in his first start, uh, Mike Smith rode him, and he, he liked him. He come back and said, you know, you're going to have some fun with this horse. Um, he was completely eliminated. He broke through maybe a half step slow, but then was actually uh, uh, pinched back um, pretty good. And uh, if you, you, you have to watch the head on to see it can't really see it in the um, the, the reg regular view of the race, but I uh, was pinched back and just kind of took him a little while to find his stride and take the dirt and uh, finished up well that day to, you know, closing fourth. But, um, you know, I kind of felt like that race, it was a throwout. It was, I didn't really treat it like it even had a race, honestly, the way he's eliminated in the beginning. So I kind of treated him as a first-time starter last weekend and you know, he, he broke and did what we want to see out of our young horses being involved early in the race. Not necessarily on the lead, but a little bit closer, obviously closer than he was in his first start. Um, and he performed well. Um, we thought he, you know, he's really turned the corner the last couple of months. We picked him up. He was bought out of a cell in France and came to us. Very immature horse and uh, really taken off of like the last two months. Uh, probably in the September, he really turned the corner and started really moving forward. Give a start there at... Uh, Keeneland, and, um, he, you know, he moved forward off that one start as well. So um, he performed well. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll give him plenty of time to recover from this. He is back to the track and moving well. Um, and, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we may look at a loud trace or stake <clears throat> moving forward in the near future. We just kind of let him tell us uh, how, it's, you know, with his works and stuff over the next few weeks where we land with him. You see any similarities between uh, Mr. Monomoy and his big sister, Monomoy Girl, either physically or mentally? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do a bit. I think, you know, they're not, they're a different color, but, you know, he's a strong, stout horse. He's obviously a strong, stout filly. Um, a lot more similarities in Cowboy Diplomacy, the, the, okay. which is 
three year old uh, as looks just like Montemoy. Uh but he's obviously run a few times and he has to break his maintenance on the farm right now. Um uh, recovering from the step back. But um yeah, I think, I think there's there's some similarities in their 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 physical makeup, just their body, height, you know, their hips, their shoulders. Um, I see I see some similarities in them. I uh, also want to go back to the stakes race uh, last weekend at Churchill, the River City. I was in handicapping uh, that race, and Mister Misunderstood. I, I was kind of where do I put that one in my mix? Was coming off the the nice win, uh, the nice second at Remington that, that seemed to have this one primed to run well. And in a blanket finish, we'll watch the, the stretch run of the River City. Mr. Misunderstood's going to be the number four horse here and right in the thick of things with Cullum Road at admissions office. Admissions office, the uh, uh, favorite in the race. But Mr. Misunderstood, nice gutsy win here. What were your thoughts on this victory for Mr. Misunderstood and what might be next for him? Well, it was a big effort, uh, to say the least. I mean, it, he, he'd had some trouble. He caught a um, case of pneumonia last winter at the fairgrounds, and we backed off of him. And Peyton Flurry was super patient with him. I told him, you're going to have to be, because when they when they do get sick like that, you, you have to give them time to recover. And he was, you know, all about giving him the time, um, and, and he did, and they rewarded him on last last weekend. Um, he's a very nice horse. I mean, you know, I think Florence said, you know, when a horse is 13, or 13 for 26 in his life. I mean, you know, you're dealing with a nice horse, so he's, uh, you know, he gives it to you every time. He, like I said, it had a little step back and um, took him a little while to get back in form. But I, I, I know some people say, well, his numbers are not as good, but he's training every bit as good. He worked the Sunday before um, last, and um, it, he was fantastic. And uh, thought he was set up for a good effort. You know, for gave him a good ride, and uh, he was able to split horses and, you know. Uh, get there in time he loves churchill he always gives you an honest effort to run over a super firm turf he'll run over you know turf with some cut in it he's just an honest horse that gives it to you every time so it was good to get him back to the winter circle yeah 13 for 20 coin flip he's a coin flip every time he goes to the, the track 13 for 26 does he uh, obviously they have a great turf program down at fairgrounds does he head down uh there with you this winter uh yeah he's back to the track moving well and he will go to the fairgrounds winter and um you know the, i think the end goal this winter would be the mervin Muniz. Uh, sure that race in late march so you know how we get there we'll, we'll see that there's a couple of uh, preps uh, you know prior you know in january and february leading up to that i don't know if we hit them all or not but um you know he, he's he's a solid horse he'll be turning six and uh, he's he's run several times but he's somewhat lightly raced this year and uh he's a very clean uh clean horse that um uh, just you know gives it to you every time like i said uh sound horse and, uh, and he's a you know hard hard knocker that hopefully can keep around a couple more years all right we'll look for him down there uh brad let's go back a couple of weeks first let me just overall say congratulations on a really nice breeders cup weekend um and, and just give me when you come out of a weekend like that just kind of uh, relate to people what your feelings were after the Breeders' Cup weekend, where, again, we will talk specifically in a minute about a couple of winners, but not, not just a couple of winners. A couple of winners who showed up, you would have to think Eclipse Awards. So how did you come out of the weekend feeling? Yeah, it was great. I mean, to, to have those type of horses and to be on that stage, is, I mean, very rewarding. And it's big for our uh, staff that put so much time and effort into these horses. And, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, yeah. you, it's a lot of work. I mean, we, we, we uh, you know, being out there with those horses and, um, you know, flying out and being on a different time schedule. And um, it, it was a lot, but it was definitely worth every second. I mean, it was uh, it was an incredible weekend. Uh, Santa Anita and Breeders' Cup did a great job, put on a great show. And uh, we just felt very fortunate to be a part of it. And, uh, and of course, you know, two, two fillies uh, that, that run – Tremendous races and gave us big efforts and, um, you know, really, um, you know, hopefully, you know, worthy of a, an Eclipse Award that, you know, that's championship material and no one can take that away from. So it was, um, it was a, a, a huge weekend to say the least. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Kefefe and take a look at that uh, Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint. Kefefe is going to be the number one horse here. Unfortunately, Come Dancing didn't show up. It, it, she would seem like... It was going to be the logical 
uh, challenger in here. It turns out instead to be Bellafina running a good second, but Kefefe, the number one horse, as the three to two favorite, three quarters of a length of victory. And Brad, we had talked to you here on the show after the Miss Preakness, which was a great victory, and kind of speculated maybe the test in Saratoga. Sure enough, she shows up there, one of the better performances of the summer with the Ding Dong Battle with Serengeti Empress. Goes down and wins the Dogwood and prep for this race. And then the great performance in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint. My question is, her only loss uh, this year was against Older in the Roxalana. So she's coming back in against Older horses in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mayor Sprint. Boy, we're looking at the performance here. What was your confidence level and was there any concern going back to the, the defeat in the Roxalana that, again, she's now stepping up against Older. How was she going to perform? What was your confidence level going into this uh, race in the Breeders' Cup? As high as it can get. <laughs> 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 no, she, she's a tremendous filly. And when you watch her work of a morning, you, you, would, you would know. I mean, she's – I've watched her work a few times and my jaw drops. I mean, she's just like – I think my stopwatch is broken. I mean, and the, and the way she's doing it and w with the ease she does it with is probably the most impressive thing. Um, the Rock Alana, I mean, listen – you know, that, that was earlier in the year. She was, you know, whatever you want to say, a freshly turned three-year-old. Um, I didn't like the trip. Um, you know, pressed the whole way, super fast. Churchill with a long stretch. Um, horses don't win very often with that trip. Um, and, you know, I talked to Alex Felice the night of the draw. I said, look, as long as we're somewhere off of a sub-22 pace, you know, around the 22 pace and we're doing it, Comfortably, we'll be okay. I mean, she always goes a half in 44, and she's always right there. It's just the opening quarter in the Roxana was extremely tough and being pressed every jump and, you know, just to get beat. The way she did, I mean, you know, it was a big effort, but it, it wasn't her trip. It wasn't favorable. And, you know, from the inside, I mean, everybody's, oh, it's with the one hole, the one hole. She was two for two from the one hole, you know, leading up to the Breeders' Cup. So it didn't bother me. I mean, I thought Joel did a great job of, um, you know, getting her where she needed to be the first eighth of a mile in the race, and that set the tone. And uh, I knew we were bringing out a fit, fast racehorse. And with the trip, I, I felt, you know, she'd be able to get it done, and she was. So uh, she's, she's an extreme an extreme talent, um, and she's, um, she's a pleasure to train, I can tell you that. Yeah, and I, I've been a fan of hers all year long. Again, as I say, we talked to you after the Miss Preakness. We had Jamie Roth on with us up in Saratoga after the test. She was obviously... Uh, over the moon, uh, LNJ Foxwoods, of course. Um, and I wonder uh, uh, what your feelings were a couple of days later, CNN Jeannie Most, with the name, obviously, there was a lot of attention. Um, and there was the, the little CNN piece that uh, they they put on based on the horse. Did you get a chance to see that? What were your thoughts there? Yeah, it was cool. I mean, it was really neat. I mean, it was a, it was a positive spin on horse racing from a, you know, a huge... Um you know, um, CNN being a huge um, network, and um, it was a positive, it was something positive going on. So it was nothing but a good thing, and uh, it, it was cool for the, you know, the, for the Philly to have that type of exposure. And, and I have to ask, I wonder if you guys have speculated. Obviously, it's out of your hands, but I wonder, it, you know, with the win, she clearly is. I would think the the leader, and and to me, uh, is there for the the Philly and Mayor Sprint Eclipse. But overall, with the way the three-year-old fillies have run this year, I mean, have you guys speculated at all that you may be looking at a three-year-old filly eclipse as well for Kefefe? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, she's got to be in the race. Yeah. You now, whether she wins, that's, like you said, out of our hands. But, you know, to, to not think that she's one of the top three, uh, uh, I think she definitely deserves to be one of the top three and on the ballot. And hopefully, she, you know, she can uh, – it would be really neat to um, for her to pick up two eclipses and uh, – um, you know, we'll see. Like I said, it's out of our hands. She's, her body work, I think, stacks up, you know, two great ones this year. Um, and, um, you know, with the way she's done it, and, um, you know, all year, I mean, you know, she was able to, you know, have put on a show at, at Pimlico in the spring for her to maintain her form, um, you know, into Saratoga, come out of Saratoga, uh, run the way she did in the Dogwood, um, and then on to the Breeders' Cup. I mean, you know, it was – you know, I think she is the three-year-old filly of the of the year. I mean, her body of work from the spring through the fall is, um, you know, it, it, it says a lot. She, she had a heck of a year, a heck of a 2019. Yeah, you, the, the test to me, I mean, obviously I'm biased up here, but the test to me, one of the better 
uh, sprints for the, the girls uh, every year, and she wins that one, and then the Breeders' Cup filly and mayor. Again, given the overall picture of the three-year-old fillies, she has to be firmly in that conversation as well. But another Eclipse uh, potential you would think would be your, your juvenile filly winner, British Idiom. Let's take a look at the stretch run there. Breeders' Cup juvenile fillies. British Idiom will be the number four horse. I like British Idiom. I was very happy with the $7.40, so thank you very much. But now three for three. Uh, one one of those restricted maiden specials up at Saratoga, restricted to the the uh, auction price of I think forty five thousand dollars or less. So then there were question marks, maybe class coming out of that. Although she did it very nicely, but she answered that with the win in the Alcibiades, and we're watching the nice ding dong duel here, where she just will not let the horse on the inside go by in the Breeders' Cup. Give me your thoughts on British Idiom and the performance in that Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. She showed a lot of heart to. Uh get there i mean i don't think she was handling the track that well uh she got bounced around in the first turn a little bit uh and, and you know for a young horse like her just the third start of her life two-year-old silly to overcome that trip and stay on i think shows just how special she is or, and she's going to be um it's a very sound silly um you know good size silly lots of length and stretch and um uh, you know i'm thinking she'll she'll hopefully get better as a three-year-old uh I mean, it's hard to say that, but I really do think she could be better um, as a three-year-old um, with what she's accomplished so far. Um, we're going to leave her here in-house. We're going to ship her down the fairgrounds in a few weeks and just start preparing her for her uh, three-year-old campaign. Uh, but, you know, I think Javier said she did struggle a little bit with the track and was able to overcome it, beat a really nice filly in Donna Veloce. Obviously, she just ran the one time, and it's going to be – she has a bright future as well. So, um, you know, we're super excited about this filly. I do think she locked up, you know, the Eclipse Award for Champion Hero filly, and she's she's, uh, she's she's an amazing filly. She, she's uh, she may have cost forty thousand, but she, she <laughs> she's worth a heck of a lot more now. And she doesn't look like a forty thousand dollar filly. What a she, she's a she's a big beautiful filly that's uh, you know uh, you know worthy of a championship. Yeah, it got, cost 40000 which again got her into that restricted maiden special up at Saratoga. But obviously the subsequent two races proved she's a bargain. So uh, good job there yeah. by Mattiket and Michael Dubb and uh, company. And you mentioned her, her game plan, uh, maybe head down to the fairgrounds and look at that uh, three-year-old Philly series down there. I want to go back to Kofefi. Kofefi a little time off on the farm, right? Yeah, she's good. she got a little break with McCaffins and Ocala. They actually broke her and... Uh... She had a break there last year, so they know her. And uh, uh, yeah, she will. She won't be out long. We will probably, you know, get her back. Say at some point in January, and start getting ready for the spring. Uh, some of the grade ones in the spring. I mean, I'm not saying we'll start back in the grade one, but you know, obviously those will be the goals. The, the Madison, the Commanda Distaff, the, the Ballerina, and obviously the Breeders' Cup Billy Mare Sprint. That, those those are races that we'll target. I'm not saying those. We'll be in all of those, or but you know those are the races that we look forward with her. Well, we like to hear the ballerina for sure up here, Brad. Before we let you go, just want to touch on one more horse. I'm going to go back and watch the Oklahoma Derby. Uh, the win by Owendale. That's a horse I've liked all year long. Uh, the uh, the nice third place finish in the Preakness was one of the highlights of the year. Win in the Ohio Derby. This win in the Oklahoma Derby. Owendale again, the number eleven horse as we're watching. Subsequently off the board in the Breeders' Cup Classic, but I've read you're considering uh, the Clark at the end of this week down at Churchill Downs. Is that in the game plans for Owendale? Yeah, it's possible he's going to work this weekend here at Churchill. Uh, if all goes well, we're going to do a little more homework on the race, see who's coming. And if things add up, uh, we may take a chance to be nicer this horse to, to um, get a, a great one victory at three. Um, we're hoping that, you know, it, that, that race makes sense. If it does, we'll take a chance. If it doesn't, we'll set it out and regroup and um, just get him ready for 2020. Uh, but he, he is doing well. He did exit the uh, Breeders' Cup in good order. Uh, was not his day, didn't take to the track very well and didn't take to the kickback and just kind of, uh, you know, gallop around there. Javier said he wasn't handling it, so he kind of, you know, uh, didn't beat him up to, to, to finish mid-pack and just regroup. And uh, he's come back to church and he's trained great, so we'll kind of kind of see how things unfold in the park over the next week or so. Well, it may not have been his day, but it was your weekend for sure. A couple weeks ago at the Breeders' Cup, Kefefi and British Idiom again, likely uh, Eclipse winners in their categories. And it was a great weekend for you. You know, we've had you on over the past couple of years, and it's been fun to watch the progression with Monomoy Girl and now some of these other horses. And we appreciate you always taking the time to jump on because it's fun to talk to you and, 
and talk about some of these horses. Wish you a lot of good luck. Dot Matrix on Saturday and potentially Owendale at the end of the week in the Clark. And again, Brad, appreciate the time. Thanks, Seth, and uh, hopefully talk to you soon and see you at Saratoga next summer. That's the game plan. Brad Cox, again, Dot Matrix on Saturday in the feature at Aqueduct and some of his other horses. It was fun to talk a little Breeders' Cup in the future of some of those horses as well. Brad Cox for taking the time. As I said to him, it's been fun to talk to him over the past, you know, it's going back a few years. He was one of those guys who you said, oh, he's on the verge, he's on the verge. And Monomoy Girl, I think, really put him in the limelight. Now he's got some nice horses. Again, a couple of uh, probable Eclipse winners with Kefefe and British Idiom a couple of weeks ago, the Breeders' Cup. Uh, so uh, it's been fun to, to kind of follow him and talk to him as we have over the past you know, year and a half, couple of years, uh, not only by phone and at some of the other venues, but certainly up at Saratoga uh, live as well. So appreciate the time Brad Cox gave to us, and uh, good luck to him today with Dot Matrix in the Red Smith. Uh, also appreciate the time from Rod Geer, Ron Gearkink from uh, Daily Racing Forum coverage at Woodbine. Again, a couple of nice stakes today at Woodbine with Pink Lloyd, and then on the two-year-old side as well in the Coronation Futurity. And tomorrow in the Best Arabian, uh, appreciate the thoughts Ron had on those stakes up at Woodbine. All right, don't forget, uh, see if you can win some money today and pocket a little bit of it to uh, play into that rainbow tomorrow at Gulfstream Park West. Uh, tomorrow is closing day at GPW. A million dollars currently, you know, so long as nobody hits it today, uh, there will be a carryover and a mandatory pay in the Rainbow Six tomorrow at GPW. Hopefully again on the show. Going to reach out so you can get uh, Ron Nicoletti maybe to join us and talk a little Rainbow Six on tomorrow's uh, racing across America. But again, there will be a uh, juicy pool by the time things uh, launch in the Rainbow Six tomorrow at GPW. So keep that in mind with the mandatory pay. Uh, don't forget, Friday, day after Thanksgiving, bounty bet mandatory pay. Speaking of mandatories, a couple thousand dollars up for grabs, and that's the day after Thanksgiving. Play the late pick five at Aqueduct with your capital OTB bet account, and you're in for all or part, potentially, of that bounty. Don't forget, there are some bonuses uh, this weekend. 3% with Churchill wagers, 2% with Delmar wagers. You just wager through your capital OTB bet account with the player rewards. Uh, there are some restrictions. Check the website for more information. Fan Appreciation Day at the Plattsburgh branch today. If you're up that way between noon and 5, love to have you swing by so we can say thank you to you. And don't forget tomorrow Sunday, NFL Sundays at the Clubhouse Racebook. Watch all the racing action and catch all the football action as well. Every Sunday during the season here at the Clubhouse Racebook, 7-Eleven Central Avenue in Albany. I'm looking up, and uh, they have just fired up with the noon post uh, today at Aqueduct. They have fired up uh, their pre-game coverage, so I'm going to step away so we can get to the Naira uh, pre-game show. I saw the big A there, Anthony Stabile. He's doing the pre-pre-game at the moment, but we'll get to uh, thoughts on today's card from the folks down at Aqueduct as I'll wrap it up on a little bit of an abbreviated edition, again, because of the early post time, the early start with Talking Horses. But as I say, appreciate Ron Gierking and Brad Cox this morning. Tomorrow morning we'll have some coverage of that Mandatory pay at Gulfstream Park West. I'll be back in eh, about an hour or so with OTB Live for this afternoon. So for this morning's edition of Racing Across America, appreciate your joining us. Stay tuned. Talking Horses from Naira, up next. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.